welcome to the genealogy radio show the radio show that's keeping you in the loop and this week's show is all about interesting o'briens and their lineages where they some of the origins of some of the lineages and how they progressed in the 1500s and 1600s. And we have a fascinating guest with us today, Kenneth Nichols, who's a renowned genealogist and historian. So we're delighted to have him on air with us today. And we're going to be talking about the O'Briens, where they ended up, some of them, and how they ended up there, and what the different branches are, and just a little nuggets of information because the O'Brien is such a fascinating surname and very well renowned in County Clare. So welcome Kenneth today to our genealogy radio show and thank you. And can you tell us a little bit about some of the interesting O'Briens? Yes, I would try to. Of course I'm speaking completely without notes from my memory so if I'm a little confused at time, I hope people will forgive it. Uh, the the, one of this uh, interesting lot of O'Briens are the bishops. There are three generations of bishops, which of course we're not supposed to do, but it was a long way to Rome. And so these things happened in Gaelic areas and indeed in often other places like Iceland, which were way, a long way from the, Rome. The, Bishop Carlos O'Brien, who was the son of a Thornish of Thomond, uh, in the late 50, 40, late 1400s, became Bishop of Killaloo and had a quite long time. He was a very active man. He was often engaged in war, like a number of Irish bishops at that time. And he seems to have married a cousin of his. Uh, are married unofficially, but we, we, have, we haven't got much information about these O'Briens. Later, genealogists tried to, to suppress them because at that time it was this author of having, uh, with the Counter Reformation, the thought of a bishop having children was not well supported among Catholics. So they were airbrushed out. Sherlock, anyway, his son Mahoon went for another clerical Turk career and he became. Bishop of Kilmacduar. And his mm -hmm. son, the second Turler, became Bishop of Killaloo, like his grandfather. So we were three generations of bishops there. And his sons, that Turler, the third Turler, married unofficially, I presume, while daughter of the first Earl of Thomond, Lord O'Brien. So it, it wasn't any question of having children by error. Uh, a concubine of the poor daughter from the lower classes. <laughs> she was an aristocrat like himself. And but his son did not go for a clerical career. That was Mahoon Macalasper, who was a very tough character. He was a, a pawn in the side of the English administration. He was eventually killed in his own castle of Clunduan near Loch Bunny by uh, the, uh, Sir Richard Biggin, the governor. He was shot, American wasn't he? Character too. Was he shot, Kenneth? He was shot. Was he um, in one of the early shootings? Or how did he, how did Bingham kill him? He was reached the castle and he was killed in the resisting. Yes. Defending it. Yes, I think he was killed in the top of it through... Um, some type of artillery as well. So just... Yes. Uh, oh, yes, he would have had artillery. That was the thing. Yes. It took Irish a bit of time to realise you couldn't defend an old-fashioned castle against artillery. Yes, and they did last a lot longer because of that. They were hard to get to. The castles were often built on very unstable... Well, Ireland was most of, over most of Ireland at that time. The only transport was by horses. There were no roads you could take a wheeled vehicle. That's right. Yeah. So that kind of explains how these tower houses survived in these yeah. areas. All which... transfer, any commercial transfer was a pack horse. Yeah. yeah. But the, anyway, Mahoon Macanaspur and his two sons eventually went to Spain. After the Kinsale, they remained in 
rebels, of course, though they lost their lands. But then the first bishop, <coughs> Turlock, had built another castle, Vale of Fjordana, which is now called O'Brien's Castle to this day, and yet in the parish of Inchcronan. Yes, and near Crosheen. Yes, near Crosheen. And he had a left a family there, another branch of the family. And there were several Francis, and they survived into the mid 18th century. It was very hard to find out anything about them. I can't find a recorded pedigree of them. And that could be because they were ashamed at that time of having decided from the bishop. They and Francis would Catholic. have been Francis would have been a featured first name of this particular branch. Yes. There were several of them, but there were at least two Francis's and perhaps three in that family. And, like, and they were the other. And then, of course, there's Ronald Nebrian, who was a kinswoman of the first bishop. She was, as a must be a very young girl, she met. John Earl of Ormond, when he came, Butler, John Butler, Earl of Ormond, when he came over from England to Ireland, he spent most of his career in Ireland. And she went through some sort of marriage ceremony with him at Kilmallock and had a son, the famous Sir James Ormond, who came, stayed in Ireland and, with O'Brien's help, tried to make himself Earl of Ormond. Even though he was illegitimate, he claimed, but he claimed to be, his mother claimed that they had been, she had been married, and you could be married very easily just by exchange of vows uh, to the Earl, his father, the Earl. And he was eventually killed by his cousin and rival, Pierce Rua Butler, in a famous episode in 1497, I think. Oh, I know. And, I know we're familiar with the Earls of Thomond, and we have also the Barons of Inchiquin, who are yes. O'Brien's as well. When the first monarch O'Brien, the last king of Thomond, last recognized king of Thomond, when he was made an Earl by Henry VIII, submit to Henry VIII, he was also made Baron of Inchiquin. His son, his eldest son, was made Baron of Inchiquin. And when he died, the earldom went by agreement to Donald O'Brien, his nephew, who was the Thornister. And he had, and he, however, got a new grant from Edward VI, giving the earldom to him and his descendants. And this annoyed his brother, Sir Donald, very much. And Sir Donald, there was a war between them and the Earl Donica was wounded and died. At Clon Road. And established himself as, as uh, O'Brien. Yes. And eventually, an English expedition put his nephew, Connor Donald, Donica's son, into uh, as Earl, and so and Sir Donald had to give up, was driven out, and eventually he was given the, the barony of Kamurua and the Stein and the Ballon and Lacken, that area. To for comp as a compensation for surrendering it claims the Pope. And is that how they kind of got a foothold into West Clare, or had they a foothold yes, into West Pope Clare? They'd already been moving in at the expense of the O'Connors. But now they were moving in again in, in the moving in a big way, yes. In the 16th century. And yeah, what about Turlock? Century. What about Turlock O'Brien, who another Turlock who ends up in West Clare around this time? He seems yes. to be that was Sir Donald's son. Yes. Sir Turlock O'Brien. And he was a Protestant. A convinced Protestant. He became a convinced Protestant. Yes, he married one of the ancient queens who was a he married a lich lady, I think, from Galway. He also well, married, didn't life. he marry one of the Inchiquins as well, and they were divorced? Oh, he did. That was his, his last, yes, his last wife. She left him. Yes. And she left him for Mercer O'Brien of the Ara family, the Maccabreans of Ara, who was a right of life, established in North Tipperary, the other side of the Shannon. And Mercer O'Brien, that Mercer O'Brien, was an interesting man too, because he became a Protestant and Queen Elizabeth appointed him as Bishop of Killaloo, which was very convenient when he ran when Slonya ran away from Sir Turlock. The bishop gave her a, a, an annulment. So he gave 
his own wife and a nun. And the wrong man, did he marries her himself. Very useful indeed. <laughs> Very. And she, um, you have the in interconnections with the Cusacks, with the family as well, so on, with the O'Briens coming into prominence at this time, and also mm. the Cusack family. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, oh, oh. Uh, no, no. The Cusacks come in first connection with the McNamara's. Do they? But that's how they move into Clare. Okay. Yeah. So, interesting. Janesh Cusack. So John McNamara marries a Cusack who succeeds her. his father by English law. That's he right. a boy when his father is McNamara chief. Another John dies. And he married a Cusack lady. And also the the O'Briens are very much it's as we've often discussed the the replication of the first names Donock, Torlock, oh yes, Morrock. The names are all the same. You see, because so Torlock O'Brien, I told you the problems, but his elder son, Pike, when Hugh O'Donnell in the Nine Years' War invaded Poland the last stage of the 1590s, he joined them and he was killed a few days later. So he was Catholic. He didn't turn he Protestant. He to join the rebels. And he, uh, uh, so Torlock may have been embarrassed by that because he had made a settlement of, in Simon and Alakan on the marriage of his son, uh, uh, Tyke to Margaret Burke from the Derry McLaughlin family, who uh, had brought an enormous diary of a couple of hundred head of cattle and yes. other things. And he may have feared that because Pike was killed at an interest in these lands and had been killed in a rebellion, that they would be confiscated. So he sold them, he sold Anna Stiven and Ballon and Lacker to Sir Henry Clare, an Englishman who had been a captain in the wars. No relation to the, no relation to the no relation to the declares who were there earlier. Two remaining sons, Donald and Donacher, prevented this, and they wouldn't let Clare or his son come into the property. And eventually, Clare gave up fighting for Sir Henry Clare, gave up fighting for possession, and he sold out to Donica Earl of Poland, who had the strength that he moved in, and he got possession of Ennis Diamond, which Sir Turlock's sons had to give up to him. That would have been the fourth Earl of Poland. Yes, the fourth Earl, the one who was a uh, governor of Munster. Yes, oh, and and uh, the Earl, the the known as the Great Earl, sixteen twenty six, and that Donica also moved into Bonratty Castle as well and restored it and yeah, did a great did, deal uh, of restoration. The Bonratty, which were, in my mind, quite wrongly demolished in the nineteen sixties. Yes, and they, he would have he would have plastered he would have plastered the ceiling, plastered the walls with, with beautiful Italian plaster and also the yeah. ceilings of the private and uh, public chapel. He put down, he, he very much built, extended the castle out as well into what would yes, be... His extensions were demolished in the restoration. That's correct. A That's a pity, yes. And also he... He very much modelled his castle on his own upbringing, where he had been brought to England and yeah. uh, reared at English court and had strong links with the Earl of Leicester. So um, yeah. that's that's very significant in the architecture of the, the restoration. And there's a date stone in the wall of 1597, which would be a mason stone mark as well, which was indicative of the fashion of the time. So there's a lot on that with Donnock. But Donnock end up, though, Donnock O'Brien seemed to end up in Clonmel. There seemed to be a link with them going to Clonmel or, or Carlo, I think. More Carlo he got than. Possession of Carlo. He was granted the man of a Carlo. Yes. So. That remained with his descendants when they were swindled out of them by an agent at the death of the last Earl of Thomond. Yes. So it started to get sketchy with the last Earls and of Thomond. 
the Skerries, the home Patrick, the Skerries estate in County Dublin too, with the same thing happened. They got swindled out of it. So the O'Briens, but the O'Briens end up, of course, in beautiful Dromoland Castle, which, uh, you know... Yes, that's a branch descended from the first Earl of... Of Cormand, yes. And his senior line uh, became Earls of each queen, the bloody Molochar of the Burnings, who had been brought up as a Protestant and married to one of St. Ledger. And he fought on the other side of the wars of the 1641. They were very bloody and destructive Battles. enemy of the Irish. And then he became a Catholic and went into exile and uh, died a Catholic. So they were, they were, they were fond of... his mind. Presumably, perhaps his wife had died would be an influence on her, on them to take the new English side. And mm -hmm. his elder son by her was a Protestant and they remained, they did very well out of in Ireland. And they uh, kept on, they kept on, the last of them became Marquess of Thomond and died in the 1850s and unfortunately all the records seem to have been destroyed or lost. No, that's a pity. And that's it what it is a great pity. And and, great and that's what happens with some of the records, which we have a patchwork of records, which we have to try and put together in pieces and so on. Yes. And it can Most be quite the difficult. The records went, were taken to England after the death of the last Earl. And most of them are now at Petworth House in Sussex because the Wyndhams inherited the Thomond estate. That's right. Under the will of the last Earl of Thomond. And we were talking about the, the to and froing of the O'Briens ending up in, I, I referred to them in the conversation of how they end up near Bansha in County Tipperary. They end up in yes, Waterford. They, they were the, really the Mac Bryans. The Mac Bryans, yes. Yes, they, the Mac Bryans, the O'Briens descended from Brian the Roo through his grandson, Turlough. But the Mac Bryans descended from Brian Baru through his younger son, but the only survived son who survived comes off, Donacha, who became King of Ireland and died at Rome eventually. But his descendants were Mac Brian. And there were some of them in Thomond who were dispossessed by the fourth Earl of Thomond, incidentally. Yes. And but the, most of them were in Kunach in the Tipperary Liberic border and in Arlo. And they Yes. And they ended up calling changing their name to O'Brien, their chief line. And they acquired Branch Hall in the eighteenth century by marrying a bottle of heiress. They have of course lost their own lands in the confiscation. And they survived down the 19th century there. They were Catholics. Yes, so they... they and, and they inherited Don Boyne with the death of the last of the old line of Lord Don Boyne. Because they were married to his sister, wasn't they? So marriages and alliances are really, really important. And what you said they about... They died out recently, the O'Brien Butlers. And what you said about the dowry not being have to be paid if somebody married a cleric is very, very interesting as well. So there was no dowry needed in relation to clerical marriages, which I hadn't been aware of. It would have been the, the attraction of it by women. Yes. So it afforded them. And also, of course, we have a very famous... Maura O'Brien. The uh, their children would have had full rights of the native Gaelic law. Yes. They wouldn't be in you know, under English law, they would have been illegitimate. As you can see from the O'Shaughnessy succession, because the daughter of the first Earl, I think her name was Alma, Alma O'Brien, was Abbess of Killogue, the O'Brien. Yeah. Nun's house, the Ennis. And she, after it was dissolved, it was granted to her father. She gave, she left, and she married O'Shaughnessy. And then later, after she had had a son by him, they got, she got a dispensation from the Pope, releasing her from her vows. And she had more sons, and there was a long dispute between those two sons in English law, because the eldest was still illegitimate in English law. And there was a great emphasis placed on English law, on legitimacy. 
So yes. that's something. After the establishment of this ritual, it took a long time to take place. Yes. It wasn't really completed till after 63. So that's kind of important to note that Irish inheritance and English inheritance is a very different matter to some extent for our listeners yes. to understand that that the yeah. emphasis on legitimacy is paramount in English law and very adhered to, but in Irish inheritance, it may not be. And uh, that's something that, that our listeners may find it difficult to understand, but it's just a fact of where inheritance goes. So I know Kenneth will have you back on and uh, we're looking forward to, to that. And thank you very much for your input today on interesting O'Briens in the 1500s and 1600s. Oh, well, we have an awful lot more to talk about during the course of our summer, and we'll focus on these Irish surnames. So um, there it's really important for to understand how they change and go back and go backwards and forwards with land ownership that they might have been in West Clare, then they were out of it. Uh, had a large number of men who fathered her children, including her cousins, and apparently her own father too. Oh yes, a great deal of she things. She sons by her own father. Yes, and and these are the things that end up they cause havoc in in the DNA world when people are are coming down into looking at that because that that shows that and it it becomes quite difficult to work out the, the bloodlines and the analytical yeah, and analyze same. Their cousins were an incredible amount. Yes. They, they, they were very endogamous, very intermarried within themselves in the 1600s and 1500s and 1600s. Yes. O'Brien's always married O'Brien's. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Kenneth, for that. And listeners, I appreciate your, your support for our show. The show is podcast out on a Sunday and we look forward to your questions. And thank you very, very much, Kenneth, for being on our show today. And thanks for listening.